Thank you for joining me. My name is Amy Guralnik. I'm a pulmonologist and I'll be leading the advanced pulmonary boot camp today for your ALS session. I'm going to share my screen with you. And we will be on our way. So today we're doing this advanced pulmonary boot camp. And the question that I always get is, are you sure I'm going to get short of breath with ALS? And the answer is probably yes. There's sort of three buckets of weakness that I always put things in. It's the arms and legs weakness. It's the ball bar weakness, which is weakness from the neck up, and then the shortness of breath. And I think the easiest way to understand this is that the same process that's making your arms and legs weak is gonna make it hard for you to breathe. There's nothing in particular wrong with your lung tissue, but it's the muscles that help you breathe, the muscles around your chest that get weak, just like your arms and your hands and your legs get weak. So if the muscles in your chest are weak, it's harder to get a big breath in, it's harder to get a big breath out, it's harder to cough. Um, if the muscles above your neck are gonna be affected, it may become harder to keep that airway open. It may be harder to breathe sort of while you're eating. So you may notice this word aspiration come up and that's sort of when you're eating and the food goes down the wrong way or down the wrong tube and uh, you'll have coughing when you're eating or drinking. So how do you know that your breathing is getting worse or your weakness is getting worse? It's a typically slow and predictable pattern. This is not something that's going to be noticeable overnight. Things are so much worse one day from one day to the next. This is going to be more like, I used to be able to walk my dog around the block without trouble. Now I have to stop a couple times. Or it may be, I used to have to stop a couple times walking my dog around the block. Now I'm getting a little shorter breath just walking to the kitchen. You may also notice that you have some difficulty breathing when you're sleeping. And there's a reason for that. When we're lying down, if you imagine your body upright and you're breathing, this is your chest, you're breathing like this. There's no gravity in this direction. But when you lie down, now you have to raise your rib cage against gravity. And because you already have some underlying weakness, that raising your rib cage against gravity becomes more difficult. The second thing is that your body's kind of like a Coke bottle. If you were to take that Coke bottle and lie it down, all the Coke kind of levels out. The same thing in your body. So all your abdominal contents, the stomach, your intestine and everything, when you lie down, it all kind of levels out and pushes up against your chest, against your diaphragm. That diaphragm is a muscle that's also weak. So now that it's weak and it's having to push all this stuff down, makes it harder to breathe. Whereas when you're upright, all the abdominal contents are sort of in the, in the bottom of the abdominal cavity. Um, you may notice that you have some other muscles helping you breathe. You may notice that your neck muscles are engaged or your shoulders, you're raising your shoulders to help you take a nice deeper breath. You may notice that your cough sounds funny or your sneezes don't feel as strong as they used to. And again, you may notice that you're having trouble with eating, that you may cough when you're eating because that food is going down the wrong way. So those are some signs and symptoms that you may be having some respiratory muscle weakness. So how do we check? How do we know that this is happening aside from the fact that you're having symptoms? The main way we check is something called PFTs or pulmonary function tests or pulmonary function studies. It's a study where they will um, check your breathing in and out. So be prepared to be yelled at. They will yell at you, suck it in deep and blow, 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 blow. Well, that's great if your muscle and your mouth is intact. If any weakness here and you go to blow and it blows out the side of this mask, we can't measure any of that air. So these tests are not perfectly designed for someone who has weakness. That being said, they're the tests that we have. So we still use them um, and we will check you upright and we will also check you lying down for those reasons that I told you before. Sometimes we see some weakness in your muscles when you're lying down long before we see them when you're upright. And that's helpful to us to know that maybe you need some help while you're sleeping or while you're lying down. Um, we will check your oxygen at rest, usually with every office visit. Sometimes, but not often, we may do a sleep study to see how your breathing is at night while you're sleeping. And sometimes, but not all the time, we'll do a blood test called an arterial blood gas. It's a little bit different than your usual blood test. They usually do it on the underside of your wrist, as opposed to drawing blood where they normally do. So what can we do to help? Now, I always like to bring things down into, into buckets. So these are my buckets, my three buckets of things that we can do to help. These are my three favorite things in the whole world. They're better than sliced bread, as far as I'm concerned. One of them is called a respiratory assist device. And there's lots of options for that. One's 
can be used invasively and some can be used non-invasively, meaning sometimes they need a mask and sometimes you need a little tube to help you use them. But the main idea there is that they are assisting your breathing. They are a respiratory assist device. The second thing is a cough assist and it's exactly what it sounds like. It helps you cough. And the third thing is breath stacking, which helps you take nice big breaths when you want, might normally not be taking those nice big breaths. So that trifecta, those three devices are really what we're gonna focus on. And I'm gonna talk about a little bit more right now. So the respiratory assist device, it's non-invasive ventilation or invasive ventilation. And like I said, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a device that helps you breathe. It improves your quality of life. It improves life expectancy and it reduces the amount of energy it takes you to breathe. This machine does not necessarily do the breathing for you. What it does is it gives you a little lift. So it's like if you're walking up the stairs and someone takes their hands and lifts your bottom up as you're walking up the stairs. You're still walking up the stairs, but it becomes much easier when someone's giving you a little bit of a lift. That's exactly what it does. It takes less energy for you to do the work of breathing Less energy means you're burning less calories and you won't lose as much weight, which is key. It can be used during the night. It can be used during the day. With certain devices, it can be used with travel. And that doesn't mean that you're going to be going to Costa Rica. It just means that potentially you're going to go see your cousin Mildred and it's a 40 minute drive and you get short of breath after 40 minutes and you can take it with you in the car. So when I talk about masks and mouthpieces and things like that, one option is going to be the mask that goes over your nose and mouth. There are other masks that go just over the nose or just under the nose, but typically with ALS, we will use a full face mask to cover the nose and mouth, which means you can breathe with any, with any hole that you want to, I suppose, if your nose or your mouth, and you still get the ventilation. The mouthpiece is more like a hookah. It's a little plastic mouthpiece, and you can keep it between your teeth all day and just kind of breathe with it. Or you can have it like this guy here in the wheelchair. He has sort of a fixed arm. You can have it attached to the back of a wheelchair. You can have it sitting next to you on the sofa and you can just have it sitting in front of you so that if you're having a conversation with your friends and you get a little short of breath, you can kind of take a rescue breath. You lean in and just take it. And it's like a sip and puff valve. Um, if you do have a lot of bulbar weakness, which is that weakness above the neck and you have a lot of mouth weakness, that sip and puff valve, that mouthpiece ventilation is very limited. Then you're really gonna be um, using the mask ventilation. So what types of, what are the different types of non-invasive non ventilation? Well, BiPAP is one that you'll hear a lot. Um, I'm sure you've heard of CPAP. CPAP is sort of what we use for patients with sleep apnea. It's not appropriate for patients who have ALS. BiPAP is similar, the PAP, stands for positive airway pressure. It's just like the opposite of a vacuum. It just blows. And the by means that there's two different pressures. So one pressure when you breathe in, and then when you go to exhale, that pressure drops. So it's easier for you to breathe in because it's blowing. And then the blowing lessens significantly when you go to exhale. So it's easier to inhale and easier to exhale. Um, the machine can be set with a backup breath so that if there are however many seconds and the machine detects that you haven't taken a breath, the machine will actually give you a breath. And that's what's called a backup breath or a backup rate. This kind of machine uses only the mask. It doesn't have mouthpiece ventilation. It plugs into a wall, typically does not have a battery. So that limits sometimes some of its daytime use and some of its travel use. The thing here is that this does not make your breathing weaker. It does not make you dependent upon the machine. May you need the machine more and more as time goes on? Yes, but it has not to do with the fact that you're using the machine. It's just the natural progression of the disease. Using the machine does not make you weaker. It also doesn't improve your breathing. It doesn't cure anything and it doesn't, it doesn't reverse anything. It does prolong life. Another option for non-invasive ventilation is gonna be AVAPs or IVAPs, which is average volume assured pressure support and intelligent volume assured. So this is a volume-based system. The BiPAP that we talked about was a pressure. We set a pressure and based on that pressure, you get a volume. With this one, we set a volume and the pressure can actually adjust. We set a range. So the volume is set for each breath and that's based on your height and your ideal body weight. 
Um, it can also have that backup breath. So the machine detects that there's a pause in your breathing for however many seconds, it will again give you that volume of breath. This kind of machine is typically used either with a mask or that mouthpiece ventilation. It can plug into the wall, but it also has a battery pack. Sometimes because of the variability maybe in the, in the pressure that's delivered in order to get that volume to you, it may be better tolerated by patients. Same goes for bi-level as for this kind of device. It does not make you weaker. It does not make you more dependent on a device. Um, and it doesn't improve things. It doesn't reverse things. It is what it is. It is a support device and it does extend life. So when we compare these two devices, um, the bi-level device only has the mask. The other devices, the AVAPs and the IVAPs are really gonna be mask or mouthpiece. The AVAPs and IVAPs also have the battery. Um, the BiPAP typically doesn't adjust. Um, so the I IVAPs and AVAPs adjusts pressure to deliver that volume. The bi-level device is, the BiPAP is actually the name of the device. For the AVAPs or IVAPs, it's either gonna be one of these three home ventilation systems called a Trilogy, an Astral, or a Voxen. There are differences between them and we'll talk about those a little bit also. But this picture at the bottom here just shows one of those home ventilation devices attached to the back of a mechanized wheelchair with that mouthpiece ventilation sort of on a stiff arm right placed right in front of where the mouth would be. So the Voxen is a little bit different than the other two because it has also a suction device and nebulizer therapies in it and a cough assist. Um, they all can be used with a mask, a mouthpiece, or invasive with a tracheostomy, and they all have battery options and plug-in options. And really the difference between some of these like a Trilogy and an Astral <clears throat> is going to be maybe what's available or what your, what your treating physician's preference is based on the information that we can download and, and the computer, how we can download that information. So when do you begin therapy? When should you start thinking about it? So one of the things is that those pulmonary function studies, which I told you are not great, they actually help the doctor figure out when you qualify for non-invasive ventilation. Like I said, they'll do the upright testing and the supine testing or the lying down testing. And sometimes those lying down numbers will be the ones that qualify you earlier. Um, and your doctor may suggest that you need to start therapy before you think you need it. And I would say, take it, you qualify for it. There's no such thing like in sleep apnea, you have to use the device a certain number of hours, a certain number of days for you to keep it. Otherwise they take it away. With ALS, you can have the device as long as you want without even really using it very much because it's a need. Um, so I would say take the device as early as you can. You may need some time getting used to it. The other thing is it may help you more than you think it will. You may wake up the morning after using it and say, I think I actually feel better. I think I slept better. I think I have more energy. And so you may need it more than you think you do. So that's just when to start therapy. And it's gonna be based a lot on pulmonary function studies but the earlier you start it, usually the better. So what about invasive therapy? So invasive therapy is typically with a tracheostomy. So a tracheotomy is the surgical opening in the neck where the breathing tube is inserted directly into your windpipe. The ventilator, that same ventilator, either the Trilogy, the Astral, the Voxen, those can be attached. The bi-level cannot be attached um, to a tracheotomy, um, but those other home ventilators can be attached. Just like every other way, this does not slow down or reverse ALS, but it will prolong life. The difference with invasive therapy, besides the fact that there's a surgery involved, is what happens after you get the therapy. With the BiPAP device, you put on the mask, you have the machine sitting next to your bed, and that's about it, or, or the, or, or the not other non-invasive, the AVAPs or the IVAPs. But with this, you need 24-hour assistance because this is considered <clears throat> life support. Usually family becomes caregivers. In addition, if you have the opportunity to have a home health caregiver, um, but this does definitely add more to do for family caregivers. Um, the ventilator will do the breathing for you when your muscles are too weak to breathe on their own. Sometimes that means you'll need it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Some patients may only need it at night. Some patients may be able to come off for an hour or two a day and, and, and be able to bathe or go sit at the table without you know, being connected. So it just depends. It's not always 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but frequently it is. 
The other thing we have to think about once you get trached is that the majority of patients with ALS who get trached cannot swallow on their own. So usually it's done in tandem with a feeding tube because eating becomes very, very difficult. Also, it becomes very, very difficult to speak. Speaking may already be a problem, so this may not be a major issue, but it's just something to consider if, um, if you do decide to go that route. So then when would you make this decision? When do you start talking about this? Well, the decision is made when you need it really, but really I start talking about this very, very early on because it's a big decision and people need to think about it. They need to talk to their family about it. Family needs to be aware of their decisions because in the event that it needs to happen, the family has to make the decision for the person. They wanna make it what, that, what the patient would actually want. Um, as other treatments, as the mask ventilation and the mouthpiece ventilation become less effective, your team may start bringing this up as an option. If you start using your BiPAP device or your Astral device or your Trilogy device, you know, more than 12 hours a day, they might start bringing up the idea, well, you know, more than half the day you have this mask on, you may be getting skin breakdown on your nose. You may still be short of breath with the mask on. That's when they may start to bring up the idea of, do you want to pursue invasive therapy? And that's the tracheostomy. And you say, well, what if I choose this? Is this gonna be my fate for the rest of my days? And the answer is no, you're in charge. If you decide six months after getting a tracheostomy that you no longer wanna have that because of quality of life or whatever decisions you've made, you don't have to, you can always disconnect from the ventilator. The main take home point here is that no matter what, you're gonna feel okay. There is hospice care, which we get involved if you're gonna be disconnected with the ventilator that can help with medication, that helps with air hunger and it helps minimize distress. So what else can we do besides the tracheostomy, besides the mask ventilation and the mouthpiece ventilation? Oftentimes people have too much saliva. There's medications which help with that. There's multiple different medications which I have um, tucked up my sleeve as options to help. Um, suction devices become very, very effective, at least just from symptomatic point of view. Vocal cord spasm <clears throat> can happen and people benefit sometimes from Botox. And I'm not saying that you get Botox in your, in your face and you look like a movie star. This is Botox right in the vocal cord and that paralysis tends to, sorry, that, that spasm tends to paralyze a little bit. I talked about breath stacking as one of those three items that I love. And I love breath stacking. Breath stacking is nothing fancy. It can be done with um, this sort of looks like a blue rubber football with a one-way mouthpiece, or it can be done with a machine. And basically what it does, it's kind of like the equivalent of blowing up a balloon. When you blow up a balloon, you blow air in and you kind of pinch it off, right? Because if you didn't, all the air would just escape and you would just be breathing in a balloon. So you blow the air in the balloon, you pinch it off, you blow it so it goes blow up, bigger, bigger. It's the same thing with breath stacking. So you have a mask on your face, you can only inhale with the mask. You can't exhale into it. So you go, take it off and exhale. It basically helps you get a big, deep breath or a sigh. And what it does is it sort of recruits the deep, dark, if you have corners, corners of your lung. Because if you're not taking deep breaths, which most people don't if they're sitting all day, then the bases of the lung can have sort of what we call microatelectasis, which is like tiny, tiny, areas of collapse. And those tiny, tiny areas of collapse, kind of like a dried up kitchen sponge, it's the perfect spot for a pneumonia. So if you do the breath stacking and you open everything up and you do that a few times and you do that a few times a day, the idea is to prevent pneumonia. So that's more of a preventative medicine, the preventative medicine, a preventative measure. If you have trouble with airway clearance, which is going to be trouble with coughing, trouble getting um, secretions out, there's a couple different options. Um, the Voxen has this built in, but there's a specific cough assist device. It's exactly what it sounds like. It assists you in coughing. You, just like when you cough, the first thing you do is you take a breath in, <sighs> right? That's how we all cough. So this machine blows a pressure of air in and then it shifts to a negative pressure. And so it simulates a cough. Um, it basically sucks. So as you yourself cough, it Again, it just assists you in coughing. And sometimes you can just get whatever's coming up to the back of your throat and then the suction device can help. The other thing that's an option is a percussion vest. You can wear it and it just percusses. It's just air sort of 
like pressurized and it will help release some of these like thicker secretions that you may not be able to get up and out. Um, so the take home messages here is that this is a multi-step approach to assisting in your breathing. We talked about the ventilation and that is a device that is used either day or night to help you breathe. And that can either be non-invasive with the mask or invasive. There's the breath stacking, which we just talked about to help you keep your lungs expanded, to help keep everything open and to try and prevent areas for pneumonia. And the cough assist, which is to help clear airway secretions, again, more of a preventative measure to help prevent pneumonias. Tracheostomy is always an option, which is what we call invasive. The idea here is no matter what you choose, it's gonna be the right decision because it's your choice. And no matter what you choose, you're never sort of gonna feel like a fish out of water. If you choose not to have a tracheostomy or if you choose to have a tracheostomy, no matter what, there's medicines that we have that will allow you to feel comfortable that take away that air hunger. So whatever choice you're making, think about it, talk about it with your family and don't make a decision really out of fear for feeling like you're gonna suffocate because we have medicine that makes whatever decision you choose the right decision. And you doctors may suggest some of these devices long before you think you need them, but I think you should try them. This is something that we have that really does improve quality of life and life expectancy. And so I would say try what we have and I wish you only the best of health. Thanks for joining me. I would like to talk about caregiver guilt because as the disease progresses, it gets more and more likely that a caregiver will experience caregiver guilt. So what is guilt? Guilt is the feeling that we get when we do something wrong. And these are examples of caregiver guilt below. So feeling like you're not doing enough, feeling guilty for being impatient, feeling guilty for feeling like you're not loving or liking the care receiver enough. Also, if something happens to the care receiver, like they fell, you feel guilty about the fall and you feel like it's your fault. Also being guilty about thinking about your own needs and feeling guilty for feeling like you want this to end. So I've listed down some coping strategies and a lot. Number one, give permission to forgive yourself. You are not perfect 24 seven and try to consider changing guilt into regret. Just like the statement below. I am doing the best I can, even though things go wrong from time to time and I regret that I am not perfect. And I would like to read out these, state these statements below because I think it's important to be said. Caring for one who has lost mobility can be physically and emotionally challenging, but can also be time to develop or strengthen bonds. The experience allows the caregiver to do the single thing that any ALS individual will appreciate, being there for them and with them. As the disease keeps progressing, more help will be needed. So please seek more help. Accept help from family members and friends. Hire caregivers if you can. Also keep an open line of communication with the medical team so that they can help you handle any complications as they arise. I also highly, highly encourage attending support groups especially caregiver support groups. Sometimes simply knowing that others are undergoing the same struggles can be enough to help get you through a tough time. Hi, I'm Peggy O'Connor, Director of Care Services with ALS United Greater Chicago. Unfortunately, at this time, we do not have a cure for ALS. This means that the majority of people currently living with ALS will at some point transition to comfort care or hospice. This is a, a difficult time of transition and I get a lot of questions about what exactly hospice is and how we know when it's time to make that transition. So I'd like to take a few minutes to just talk through that process a little bit. 
So hospice is defined as supportive care for a patient and family in the final months of terminal illness. Now, I often hear that people had a older relative who was referred to hospice and then passed away only a few days later. Um, my usual answer is that that hospice referral probably went in too late. Our goal is to connect people with ALS with the hospice team as soon as possible so that you can build a rapport and a relationship so that they know what the patient's priorities and preferences are so that when things get complicated, you have a team that you are familiar with and feel comfortable leaning into for that support. Um, hospice care is focused on making the patient physically and emotionally as comfortable as possible. So um, the real focus shifts from fighting and trying to slow down the disease to just making the patient comfortable. This means that disease modifying drugs like Riluzole, Radicava, Relivrio are no longer a part of the treatment plan. So when hospice is started, those medications do stop. Um, the disease has at that point progressed to a point where we're not able to really slow it down. Hospice care does take place in the patient's home where they have been living, whether it's house, apartment, condo, ho hospice services will come to the patient. If a patient is living in a nursing home or assisted living facility, hospice services can be provided there as well. It does not involve relocating to a different place. Hospice care is provided by a team, very much like what we do throughout ALS care. There are core members of a hospice team. There is a physician medical director. The neurologist often stays involved at the hospice stage too to be a, a consultant as far as symptom management and ALS specific concerns. There is a nurse case manager that kind of leads the care team and is the point person. They will visit the patient one or more times a week to do assessments teach the family how to manage medications um, and just manage the care plan. They're, a lot of their role is education. They will not be there all the time to manage medications. So they will be educating family or paid caregivers on how to administer the medications. There's also a social work who can su provide similar support to the social work you, you see earlier in the disease, they can connect to local resources, and they are very important for emotional support during this time. Hospice does provide a home health aid that can help with bathing um, a few times a week, but those visits are just brief. They'll come in and help on their schedule, um, but it is another set of hands that is greatly appreciated. Spiritual support is also a big part of hospice care. Um, the word chaplain has um, sometimes more religious meaning than some people are comfortable with, but chaplains are skilled in all areas of spiritual support, and they can help connect you with your existing faith community if you've drifted from them or provide more non-denominational non support. Um, hospice teams also provide bereavement support after a loss, so they will be reaching out to the family to check in periodically and see if any additional support is needed. Um, supplemental services that can be provided by hospice can include massage or music therapy, which can be very helpful in just easing anxiety for the patient. So the admission criteria for hospice for someone with ALS involve three specific areas. Critically impaired breathing capacity. So when that forced vital capacity that we're checking in clinic falls below 30% of what would be predicted for the patients, um, that's the time when we'll start thinking about a hospice referral and they may be eligible. Um, if there is rapid progression of the disease, going from being able to walk to not being able to bear weight at all in a very short time, that can also qualify for hospice admission if that is paired with critical nutritional impairment. Because if progression is fasting, bleh, 
if progression is occurring that quickly, um, very likely the ability to swallow and absorb nutrients is also being impacted. So the patient is having significant progression of their limb strength as well as losing weight and having difficulty swallowing. There can also be rapid progression with life-threatening complications. So patients who have been hospitalized multiple times for pneumonias, which often happens later in the disease, patients who have multiple pressure sores that are not healing because the patient is malnourished and they just can't get in enough nutrition to keep their tissues healthy and healing. So um, those kinds of medical complications can also tell us that it's time for a hospice referral. So it's specifically what hospice provides is intermittent visits to provide education, support, and guidance. The hospice team does not stay 24-7. So the day-to-day -day care falls to family caregivers. Hospice does provide any medications related to the management of ALS symptoms. So medications for excess secretions, to ease the breathing, anything that the patient is taking for muscle cramping, those will continue and be part of the hospice plan of care. Um, hospice also provides equipment that is provided for daily care. They will be able to get a hospital bed, a Hoyer lift, um, those kinds of equipments into the home, and they can turn that around much more quickly than an order from the doctor's office. The hospice equipment can get there in a day. Um, and again, hospice also provides bereavement follow-up. Um, again, 24-7 care is not covered by hospice. The hands-on day-to-day care does continue to fall for, to family or paid caregivers. Um, treatment intended to treat or cure terminal illness is not covered by hospice. So again, when it's time to go to hospice, we're, those medications that were slowing down the progression of the disease will be stopped. If a patient is at a skilled nursing facility, hospice does not cover room and board. So the room fees for being at the nursing home will still be the responsibility of the family. Um, and trips to the emergency room are not part of what is covered under hospice unless the hospice orders it. So the understanding when someone is on hospice is that we're not going to the hospital to treat repeated pneumonias. The decision is to keep the patient comfortable at home and not have them go back and forth to the hospital anymore. There are different levels of hospice care and this can be a little bit confusing. So routine hospice care is what happens for the vast majority of time that people are on hospice. That's when the nurse comes a couple times a week, the social worker comes every other week or so, the home health aide comes one to three times a week, depending on what the care plan says. That is that is the routine level of care. That is what, um, and the family caregivers are the ones administering the medications and responding to the symptoms. General inpatient care is when the patient goes to the hospital on a hospice unit or goes to a freestanding hospice unit. This is for crisis management. It is not a long-term plan. So if a patient is having difficulty breathing at home that we just can't get a handle on in the home, the patient will be brought to either the hospice unit. The treatment plan will be tuned up and we'll get a handle on the symptoms, but then the goal is for the patient to return back to the home setting. The hospice benefit also includes respite. So every the hospice is renewed every 60 days with a reevaluation of the patient to confirm that yes, there is continued decline and progression of the disease and they're eligible for hospice. Within each of those 60 day periods, patients can have five days of respite stay. That is not caregivers coming to the home. This does involve the patient going to very often a nursing home or um, sometimes an inpatient hospice unit for five days to give respite for the family caregiver because even Medicare understands that this is a significant 
um, a significant burden for caregivers and they need a break sometimes. So that is built into the hospice benefit. And um, I want to make sure that all caregivers are aware that that's part of the deal. Um, continuous care is short-term in-home support. Sometimes um, either the patient is not stable to transfer to an inpatient unit or we're not quite there. They just need a little bit extra hands um, and closer monitoring and management is short-term in-home support. Again, with the goal being to transition back to the family caregivers, but for maybe a 24-hour period, the hospice can provide a, a nurse and an aide to just tune things up and get a better handle on symptoms if they're being if they're difficult to control. But again, the vast majority of the time people are on hospice, they're on routine care. And most people don't even require um, inpatient or continuous care. The other question that we get a lot is how do we choose a hospice company? There are so many out there. Um, it's important to work with a hospice that has experience with ALS and is able to provide and support the respiratory equipment. Going on hospice does not mean that you have to give up your non-invasive ventilator or your BiPAP support. That continues and the hospice has to help provide that. So make sure that you ask questions about the level of ALS experience and um, your clinic team and care services coordinator are excellent resources. We work very closely with hospice companies. We provide in-services. So um, we always have a, a list, and it's a short list, of the companies that we are comfortable taking care of our people with ALS. Hello, everyone. I am Jennifer Beckman. I'm a care services coordinator with the ALS United Greater Chicago Chapter, and I am here to talk about bereavement. I run our um, bereavement uh, program support group that meets every third Wednesday of the month. Um, I know that you've probably had a long day already, and I just kind of want to acknowledge that um, my part of this uh, boot camp is also very heavy. And um, I, like I said, I wanted to acknowledge that um, and just let you know that I'm thinking all of you about all of you um, during this time. And um, although it's difficult, it's very important conversations to have. So if there's, if you ever need anything, um, there's my contact information. Well, you know, we're happy to help in any way that we can. Today's topic starts off with anticipatory grief. Um, you know, when you're working with someone or your loved one um, that has ALS, that a lot of things will change and be different and there'll, there'll be some losses. And so, you know, we grief, there's a lot of layers to it and it's, it's um, occurring even when you're in that caregiving mode. Um, but it's important to acknowledge that and um, just be mindful of it so that we can, you know, we can be mindful of it so that we can help ourselves take care of ourselves. Um, some common experiences that you might experience with uh, anticipatory grief, you know, they, they're parallel to grief in general. You might feel sadness or tearfulness, fear, irritability, um, not wanting to see other people or be around people. Uh, you might want to get these feelings out, or you might want to isolate and not really talk to anyone. Um, anxiety, guilt, um, intense concern. And, you know, sometimes we feel physical problems. We feel physical pain. Um, that's why you may have heard before, we really encourage caregivers to take care of themselves, both emotionally and physically. Make sure you're still seeing your doctors on a regular basis. And like I mentioned, it's, it's good to be aware of these thoughts and feelings so that you can work on having some coping skills that could help you in the future with these. Um, you want to first, of course, identify them, um, allowing yourself to feel whatever emotion is coming up is really important. I know sometimes we do we tend to want to shove things down, but it's really important to um, to allow that feeling to come up, whether it's anger, sadness, you know, even a little bit of joy. It's OK to feel joy. Um, you want to talk about your feelings with others. 
Um, you want to resolve and forgive past wrongs, make plans for the future, live in the present, um, making sure, like I said, you're taking care of yourself, you're going to your appointments, and you're all the things that you have on your to-do list, but making sure you're taking time for yourself, living in the present, still feeling that joy, doing as much, doing as, much as you can in that regard. Oftentimes I talk about how grief is like riding a wave. Um, you never know what uh, feeling you're going to have next. You might be feeling good and then suddenly something pops up and you're not feeling as good. And so we, or we, I call that riding the wave. Um, grief is not linear. Like I said, it's going to be up. There's going to be ups and downs. There might be a couple days of ups and a day of downs. Um, there's no timeline to grieve. The question I get asked a lot is, you know, you know, how, how long am I going to feel this way? Or I've been feeling this way for two years. Is, is this okay? Or quote unquote normal. There's no timeline. Um, people grieve differently and people grieve for a different amount of times. Um, the only time I ever give a, a, some sort of a timeline, it's, you know, not set in stone. Um, but normally I advise um, people to not make any really big decisions for at least 12 months because, you know, there's a, like I said, there's a lot of thoughts and feelings going through our minds when we're grieving. And so it's probably best to not make really big decisions, at least for the first year. Um, there are five stages of grief, um, as identified by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and they are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. These five stages, um, you, some folks may experience all the stages, some folks may not, you know, may experience only a couple. There's no timeline, there's no, you, you first you do this, you do this, you might, you know, be in denial, and then be in anger and back to denial, there's no smooth path for that. So it's just a way to identify some stages of grief to help um, help us better cope. And like I said, learn some skills to help um, us along our journeys. Decision-making. Um, I know, like I, like I mentioned, I know that this is a very heavy topic. I mean, it's a difficult to have conversations, but I cannot stress enough how important these conversations are to have um, because it's, it's, it's even more difficult when you're, you know, if you, if you don't make these decisions now and have to scramble later on. Um, I, I used to work in hospice and I've seen a lot of folks that have put off these decisions, put off these decisions and in doing so makes it a lot more difficult when this time comes. So the fact that you're doing this class and learning all that you can is really um, so amazing. And so I hope that um, you'll consider start to have, have some of these conversations. Um, a do not resuscitate order is when um, a person has chosen that they do not want um, life-sustaining treatment. And um, there is a specific form for that. So if you need help with, if you need help with any of these, please reach out to the um, ALS United Greater Chicago chapter. You want to talk about either cremation or burial, what you would want, what they would want in the obituary, planning the services, and um, if they want to be an organ donor. Um, just some tips um, for those last few days. Um, it's really important if you if the person has decided to do a, a do not resuscitate or a DNR, it has to be visible in the house. Um, if the paramedics um, do not see that, if you're at home and the paramedics do not see that, then they will perform CPR. And so make sure that it is visible. I usually suggest that people put it, um, tape it to a cabinet in the kitchen or ever, you know, somewhere that's very visible. Like I mentioned before, we are available for, for help and support. Um, if you notice any changes, you know, please call hospice right away. Um, if family and friends are reaching out and wanting to know what they can do to help you, please be specific. Um, you know, whether that's having some meals or, you know, giving you some respite and, and having them sit with your loved one, um, set boundaries um, when it's appropriate and when you need them. Um, there's nothing wrong with setting some boundaries or telling someone that you don't want this or what that or telling someone no is okay. Um, and it's also okay to take breaks. Like I said, you have to take care of yourself before you can take care of anyone else. So, you know, allow yourself to take breaks as you need them. 
Um, what's next? You can get support from hospice um, and or always loved and supported, which is our bereavement support group. Um, you know, as best as you can, drop any feelings of guilt or things that you could have done differently. I talk to a lot of folks that sometimes struggle with this. They wish they would have done that. Um, I call the shoulda, coulda, wouldas. Um, and we, us as humans, can do that in, in so many situations. Um, you know, and hindsight's always 20 20. Um, so, you know, make sure you tell yourself that you have done everything that you possibly can with the amount of information and the resources that you had at the time. Um, acknowledge the uncomfortable mix of grief and relief. I've also heard from folks that they feel both of those things, and it's absolutely okay to feel both of those things. You know, caregiving is a very serious job. And so if you do feel some relief, that is completely normal or common. Um, once you've gotten help with your grief, when you're feeling a little bit better, maybe, you know, again, focus on you and what you like to do, the things that you used to enjoy. Maybe you had to give up because of caregiving. Um, so, you know, put that focus back on you. Um, that's not being selfish at all. Keeping yourself busy, busy, finding a new routine is always great for any of us in any situation, but, um, you know, making sure, you know, cause you, you've had a lifestyle change and so you've got probably more free time than you had before. So keep yourself busy, maybe exercise. And like I said before, do things that you enjoy to do. And taking care of yourself, like I've mentioned a couple of times, making sure that you're going to the doctor on a regular basis for yourself and, you know, incorporating all of the things that you used to enjoy. These are just some um, tips that I've heard from um, other folks that I've worked with, some information that I've uh, learned as a professional. Um, some of these are... Um, you know, easy, but sometimes we forget, especially when we're in a, you know, uh, high emotional state. Um, so these are just some good tips to have when the time comes so that, you know, so you don't miss anything and it'll help you in, in you know, later on when you're trying to wrap everything up. Um, you want to get 10 copies of the death certificate, find the will, and hopefully you have all these things, um, and the will and executor um, handy. Um and there's that list there. There's also a complete list as the AARP.org uh, website has all of, all of the things for you um, to keep on hand. Um, like I said, I had heard from some folks who mentioned not to turn off the person's cell phone right away um, because it makes it a little bit easier um, when you're wrapping up bills and payments, sometimes, you know, when you have to, if you log into a website and you have to have the security code. And so if you don't have all the passwords, it's helpful to maybe not turn off the cell phone right away and make it a little bit easier on the, on the back end. You don't want to do everything at once. You do not have to do everything at once. It's going to be really overwhelming and um, because there's a lot to do. And so maybe set some goals for yourself to maybe accomplish two or three tasks a day that does not have to be done all at once. It also doesn't have to be done in a hurry. So take as much time as you need. And um, of course, reach out for support if you need it and, and ask for help. We're happy to help, or I'm sure you have friends and family that would be also willing to help. Speaking of us that can help, um, we are here to support you. Um, like I mentioned, the Always Loved and Supported Bereavement Support Group meets every third Wednesday of the month from 7 to 8.30. It's virtual. Um, it's via Zoom, and so he, the link is on here. But if you have any questions or need anything, ALS United Greater Chicago Chapter is here to help you. There's my contact information. Please feel free to reach out. And here are some more resources for you. And um, again, if you have any questions or need anything, please reach out. We're happy to help.